G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. It is just about that period of the year where we transition from thinking about the trade period to the draft. I myself am currently working on a mock draft that I should be able to get to you sometime in the coming week. Um, so in today's video, I wanted to take a look at some potential pick swaps because when you, when you start looking at the Phantom Draft, I get to pick two with North Melbourne there in particular and I start thinking, well, I just don't expect North Melbourne to actually holding this pick on the night of the draft and then you get further through the first round and I wanted to take today's video to map out some potential pick swaps and speculate on clubs that might be interested in doing that and that includes pick swaps that can occur from now until about 10 days before the draft I'm not sure on the exact date there but also some live trades that we could see and different clubs will have various motivations for either swapping before the draft or swapping during the draft and we'll get into all of that some of the potential pick swaps I've got in this I've, I've mapped out a few mock trades if you like um, some of them are my own concoction but a lot of them are based on things that have been speculated on or reported in the media as well. And I wanna get the feelers for what fans of various clubs will think. Obviously, it's coming out with mock trades, it's gonna be super subjective. Before we crack in, once again, thank you so much to everyone who's jumped on board and subscribed to this channel recently. If I'm not mistaken, this is on track to be the second biggest month for growth this channel has ever seen. So I wanna thank you so much for everyone who's jumped on board. And if there's anyone who's been watching the content and hasn't thought to hit subscribe or wants to see more footy content, I'd appreciate it if you did so. All right, let's start speculating on some pick swaps. So the first most obvious one that I think everyone accepts is mostly a foregone conclusion, which is not quite ever the case, but I think North Melbourne and Richmond dealing for North Melbourne's pick two is seriously going to be on the cards here. What is less clear is exactly how that gets done. And it's really hard to map out exactly what both clubs will deem as fair in this year's draft. So what are North Melbourne's motivations for splitting pick two? If you look at their draft hand, they hold two and 62 in this year's draft. And it is a fairly even draft, so you can understand the motivation for them splitting that pick and getting some evenly rated talents rather than just take pick two and 62. The other thing with North Melbourne is my belief, and it seems to be shared out there by a lot of fans, is that this is the draft they need to look at some quality tools. Relatively speaking, this draft is not only deep, but it's quite filled with quality tools that you don't see every year. Sometimes you'll have drafts come and go and only a handful of quality tools get taken. Well, this year is the year where plenty of key forwards and a handful of key backs could feature in the top 30. So in looking at North Melbourne's list, you know, they've got a way up. A, do we just want to take the one pick before 62? But secondly, you know, if they hold pick two, they could just take the best available tall, but there's not a lot of value in that when the best available tall might last to pick six or seven. And if they hold the pick at pick two, you mean they could pick Finn O'Sullivan or whoever's going to be there, Jagger Smith, Sam Lawler. I just don't know if North Melbourne really need to spend pick two on another premium midfielder. I mean, no club really gets sick of having gun midfielders on their team, but for where North's at, it just makes so much more sense for them to trade down. So that's a North Melbourne motivation here. Uh, you can, I can clearly see why they would want to move down. And I, I believe Brady Rawlings did say he didn't want to move too far down, which makes sense. If you want to trade down from two, I don't think North Melbourne want to move past pick six. If, if their target is Harry Armstrong, which a lot of people are making that connection, I have no idea if it's true, but it would make sense. Uh, trading from pick two down to say 10 and 11, I could be wrong, but I, I would see why North Melbourne would really want to keep pick six or go for pick six from Richmond here. So why would Richmond trade a couple of picks for pick two? Well, my take on Richmond's draft hand this year, they've got eight picks in the top 24, and it's unclear to me how many of those they intend to take. If it was me in their shoes, I would probably be willing to condense that down to six, okay? So there's a couple ways they could do that. They could trade two later picks to get back up into the top two and pick the two best midfielders in this year's draft outside of Levi Ashcroft. They seem to be connected to a handful of players. They seem to like Sam Lawler, Finn O'Sullivan, Jagger Smith, Harvey Langford. That's what's being reported. They like a lot of these types. So if they want to pick two of the very best, that's their motivation for getting pick two. Pick six is not a bad pick to hold, but they're in a position to say package six and I don't know, maybe 18 to move up to two. So that would condense two picks into one. Richmond may be willing to do that once, but maybe not two. Twice. So I'd say if it gets them picked two in this year's draft, that would be their motivation. Then I think in the background, they might also consider 
trading one of their remaining seven picks into the future to kind of spread out that talent. They do say the top end of next year's draft is very strong. Now, every year we hear that the next draft is really strong, but the differentiating factors between 2024 and 2025 is as far as I can tell, this one's probably deeper and more even and comparatively less compromised. 2025 has a lot of academy picks, that that's a, a big downside and it may not have the depth or the evenness, but they do say the top, ta the top handful of talents in next year's draft could actually trump this year's. So for a variety of reasons, Richmond could look to trade into the future. With this particular trade though, however, I would say that North could potentially offer pick two and a future third to Richmond for picks six and 18 in this year's draft. That is certainly what I would target if I was North Melbourne. And for Richmond, they bank a future third next year. And in a year that is going to be compromised, a future third may not hold a lot of points, but we know it will hold some points. Basically any pick in the first three rounds with the academy rules changing next year will hold some level of points. Now those picks will shift and whatever you hold at the start of the draft might change throughout as picks get absorbed. But we can assume that a likely early third rounder here from North Melbourne will hold some points for Richmond so they could use that next year to trade up again. North Melbourne then get pick six and they could target you know the best quality tall in this year's draft who I think is probably gonna be Harry Armstrong at this point and hold 18 for either another tall or a small forward or just the best available talent. They get two picks in the top 20 they get their man Richmond get the two best midfielders in this draft I think this one could be mutually beneficial let's move on to the next potential pick trade I reckon so one of them is Sydney I want to start with Sydney they hold pick 19 and 22 in this year's draft and later in the draft, I don't know exactly where a bid's gonna come, but I think they have Joel Cochran as a key defender who is likely to be picked up through their academy provided he gets bid, bid on and matched. So prior to the trade period, we'd heard that Sydney holding 19 and 22 currently, they were interested in pick 13, which uh, I think was at Gold Coast originally, now is at Port Adelaide. So if we conclude that Sydney have an interest in condensing two picks into one better one, probably before 15, they presumably have that interest again. Now, why do they do that? You know, perhaps they just think that one pick in the top 15 of this draft trumps 19 and 22. Is there a possibility they'd one, one early pick and then, you know, bank some more academy points for Joel Cochran? I'm not too sure where a bid's gonna fall for him. It might be around the 30s or 40s. I really don't know, to be honest. But we do know that Sydney have some interest here, so they just need to find a candidate. So who holds a pick in the top 15 that would be willing to trade down for two later picks? So now that that picks at Port Adelaide, I, I guess they could. I mean, Port Adelaide haven't taken an early pick for a while now. Um, so their motivation for holding pick 13 rather than trading it for 19 and 22 it's hard to speculate for sure, but I would imagine Port Adelaide that we would be hard to prize that loose out of the port. There's West Coast who hold pick 12. Now, West Coast, you know, it's hard to predict what they'll do. I didn't think they would trade pick three down for 12 to begin with. So would they trade it down again for 19 and 22? The thing with West Coast is they probably need to, to get another pick in this year's draft somehow. So that is one option, but probably not plan A for West Coast. I mean, pick 12 to, down to 19, that is probably an easier case to make as a being a good move than say three down to 12. I think 12 down to 19 is more justifiable. That being said, would they trade again all the way to only enter the draft at 19? I think that would be tricky. And then there's Fremantle who will pick 14. Um, maybe they could be a candidate, but they've traded their other two first rounders in a strong draft that you'd think they wanna keep it. The only thing that might tempt them to trade it is potentially into the future if they're serious about a bid for Chad Warner. So again, uh, the candidate there is not that strong. Um, there's Richmond with pick 11, and I'm not sure they're gonna be tempted by that. So perhaps is it GWS? Would GWS be willing to trade pick 15 to Sydney for picks 19 and 22. The reason I highlight GWS is because I think over the years, and they've kind of said this themselves, they don't pick from the same talent pool as others. So would that make them more willing to, you know, go back considering the guys they might want at their first pick might not be as high on other people's boards. We saw that last year with Phoenix Goddard and that's why they were willing to trade back a little bit. So the, could they do a little bit of a deal here with their crosstown rival and switch 15 and 56 for 19 and 22? That 56 may not get used by the Giants anyway and it would help Sydney match a bid for Cochrane. I've just turned off the camera and had a look at my trades and I'd like to make an amendment here. 19 and 22 for 15 and 56 probably shafts Sydney. Let's change it to 15 and 37 for 19 and 22. I don't mind that one. It depends on GWS's assessment, how many picks they want to take. Does it give them too many picks in this year's draft? Maybe, but let's move to my next live trade. West Coast is surely going to want to trade back into this year's first round to hold 
three picks, 12, 26, and 73 in a strong draft. I don't think is a very good position to be in. However, they do hold Hawthorne's future first. So can they dangle a future first from Hawthorne to get back into this year's draft. So we need to then establish what do we think a future third first from Hawthorne is likely to be worth in this year's draft. I've said this in previous videos, but I think if you're trading a future pick into the current draft, you always pay a little bit of an exchange rate on that. The reason being there's always more value placed on the immediacy of it. And this year's draft is fairly strong. I know I said the top end, I don't know exactly what you want to say about that. Top 10 maybe is stronger next year potentially, but we don't know that it's still early days. So I think either way, whatever you slice it, a future first from Hawthorne is going to not be traded for an equal pick in this year's draft. So what do we rate Hawthorne's future first at? This year it was 14. You could you could easily make the case they'll improve, but it's not really a given, right? So if Sydney's just done that deal with GWS, would West Coast be able to trade Hawthorne's future first for GWS's pick 21 in this year's draft? Now, again, that's incurring a little bit of a, a loss on West Coast part, but that's the position they're in. They've got to trade into this year's draft, pay a little bit of a premium on that, and have to tempt GWS with this deal. This will kind of depend on what else is on offer here for West Coast. So I'd imagine West Coast is probably one of those teams targeting one of Richmond's eight picks. And, um, and again, Richmond could be tempted by that, but we'll move to Richmond next because I think they'll get a better deal than what West Coast can offer them. And they won't do two trades into the future, in my opinion. If they've already done a deal with North, I think they'll keep minimum six picks, if I had to guess. So if West Coast get beaten to the punch for you know one of Richmond's eight picks, this is where they might go to GWS, who just turned one pick into two. I think this is a slam dunk for GWS, and it's risky on West Coast's part. Do they hold that extra first rounder for a bid for Chad Warner? They've got to pay something decent to get back into this year's draft, I would suggest. And the other candidate, I think, here to seriously trade in to this year's draft will be Essendon. I think this is absolutely on the cards. Whether they will be successful is another question. So they hold their own future first and Melbourne's future first. So either one of those could be traded into this year's draft. Now, why did they not do this already? Well, they are accumulating points for a bid for Isaac Kako, and it seems like there's a little bit of belief that he could get bid on in the top eight selections. And if that's the case, that's why they traded nine into the future. So what I suspect will happen is this, if Essendon are successful in getting a trade done, it will be done live after an Isaac Kako bid has been matched. Essendon can then live trade their future first or at Melbourne's future first to a team on draft night to get another selection in this year's draft. The thing is with Essendon and live trading it is an expensive way to trade. So once again, they have to decide what they value either of their future firsts at and what is the equivalent of that pick in this year's draft, knowing they're gonna cop a bit of a tax on that. When I say tax, I just mean they're paying a bit of a premium, there's no actual tax. So do they trade their own future first or Melbourne's future first? Valuing Melbourne's future first is also tricky. They've got a team profile or a list profile that could compete for finals and potentially go deep on talent, but there's just so much going on there. I mean, this year, their first pick was pick five, but what was it last year? They traded that pick, so that gets messy, but they finished top four and went out in straight sets last year. So point being, that value is probably tough to value, but would you value it more than Essendon's? We probably have more of a feel that Essendon's gonna finish mid table, I would have thought. So I think most would conclude that Melbourne, if you're being conservative, you'd value that pick as not as good as Essendon's future first. So do they trade Melbourne's future first to Richmond? Well, they could get it done for like pick 23. Again, it, it really depends on everything that's happened here first. Now I said that West Coast might get beaten to the punch for one of Richmond's picks by Essendon. But unless Richmond do a deal with Essendon, like a handshake deal before the draft, and they've sort of negotiated what's likely to happen on draft night, which is distinctly possible, Essendon and Melbourne can't get this deal done first. So I suppose there's still a million ways this could all play out. But if it gets to draft night and Essendon want another pick, Melbourne's future first for Richmond's 23 or something like that, it's not a great deal on value for Essendon, but the benefit is they get into this year's draft and they just have to accept the cost of trading into the present from the future. Those are the main candidates, I think, for trading into the, the present. I think every team kind of has a reason not to. The only other one I can think of is like Geelong, maybe. They hold a future first, naturally, but don't hold a pick before 45 in this year's draft. Now, that future first, do, are they weighing up a move for Clayton Oliver next year? 
that would be another reason not to, but they're probably one that leaps off the page as having some interest potentially. So I've given you all my mock trades, um, but what we might do is I might just flash up every team that's been involved in the mock trades that I've done. This will be new, their new hand. So if Richmond, so if Richmond do the deal with Essendon and North Melbourne, like I've mapped out, they'll hold one, two, 10, 11, 20, 24. So six picks in the top 24 of this year's draft. They hold their own future first and Melbourne's and they hold a future third from North Melbourne, which does hold some points. So I think that kind of achieves the aims that Richmond might have. West Coast would hold 12, 21, 26, and 73. That's from trading Hawthorne's future first to the Giants for pick 21. So they get three top 26 talents, and it's not an amazing hand, but it's certainly better than what it might be if they don't do the trade. Essendon's draft hand won't necessarily change because we're talking about a live trade here, but they would potentially get pick eight through Isaac Kako or wherever a bid actually falls for him, as well as pick 23. So another top 25 talent, and they've paid a little bit of a premium giving up Melbourne's future first. Sydney as a result of their deal with GWS would hold pick 15, take the best available talent and they don't need to draft a key back as that would be coming in the form of Joel Cochran. Now they would also hold 44, 56, 59. So once again, coming in with another amendment here, Sydney would hold 37, 44 and 59. So plenty of points to match a bid for Joel Cochran and potentially get another pick in before that. So then GWS might be the biggest winner out of this. They will hold 16, 19, 22, and 37 so that draft hand is about like it's not much worse i think they've basically moved 15 to 19 and 21 to 22 but they've banked a hawthorne future first and they still have adelaide's future second in that as well so that's me mapping out a, a few potential trades look I, I don't expect to get these bang on obviously and let me know in the comments if you think any of these are bad deals for your club or any particular club it is tricky and i do rely on a bit of feedback so if overwhelming amounts of people tell me this is dumb then i will consider that for my mock draft because i want to have some mock trades in there but i think the teams that i've got there are pretty bang on i do think all of these teams whether it's been reported on or whether it's just my opinion i think all of these teams have rock solid reasons to trade in but if you can think of anyone else also let me know in the comments but for now guys i'll thank you for watching i'll thank you for being subscribed i'll see you in the next video cheers